Barbara pointed out, and as you can see for yourselves, we've kept the, lesson, the best to the last. Uh, we have a marvellous panel here. Um, I'm going to be quite fierce and keep them to time, because although some of us have the privilege of having them on speed dial, I know that you uh, don't all have that, and so you'll want some time to be able to, to ask questions. Um, it's been a fascinating two days. Um, this panel is about energy, and when all said and done, energy is, is fundamental to the development of all other infrastructure in the African continent and elsewhere. Without energy, the economy cannot thrive, infrastructure cannot be developed, banks have no projects to lend to, and we core United sponsors have very few deals uh, coming across our desks that we can actually get our arms around. We heard a lot about cross-border um, investments, um, and that, of course, includes power transmission, but we see very few of those uh, yet. And uh, to, to paraphrase one of my more cynical colleagues, cross-border transmission projects consist of taking power from people who don't have it to people who can't or won't pay for it. So um, we have a long way to go on power transmission but we also need to solve the question of power that people don't have. Nowadays, you see all over Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, you see young people, even old people like me, with mobile phones. Those young people are doing their homework by candlelight, but they can see that the rest of the world does not operate like that, that it doesn't have to be like that. And we have a duty to try to solve that problem. The numbers are meaningless, somebody said that earlier today. Five billion, 10 billion, however much. It, 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 it's not <coughs> happening. The, the population of Sub-Saharan Africa is growing faster than the percentage of people who have access to ele electricity, and that's a disgrace. We've got to fix the problem. Um, the mention of focus countries, um, I notice Andy Herskovitz sitting in the audience there. I would be very remiss if I didn't make mention of Power Africa, which of course did start with Focus countries. Elizabeth, do you want to say a few words about that? Maybe. Uh, sure, absolutely. So I think many, most of you know that uh, President Obama announced the Power Africa Initiative because he felt so strongly, as you do, and we all do, Helen, Helen, that um, with 600 million people on the continent without any ability to have regular access to power was unconscionable. And this was something that we have within us the power to address. So the initial aim was to, to double access to energy across the continent with a commitment of $7 billion by US government agencies at the outset um, to be available not just in the six countries, but across the entire continent. Um, the six countries are really the focus of the transaction advisors to, uh, coordinated by USAID. And I've got to say, we're, we're frankly, the $7 billion that was committed is easily going to be exceeded, I believe because we're all demand-driven agencies and we're seeing a lot of interest for financing across the entire continent, so I think we'll, we'll do more than that. And what I want to just say is that what we've seen uh, in Power Africa, which has been, as you said, so ably coordinated by Andy and his team, is basically three things that I didn't expect, which have been a testament to its success already. Uh, as you know, developing power is a long-term game, so we, we, sh we shouldn't be expecting immediate returns, but we, already, we have seen uh, immediate returns in, in three facets. One is, we've seen developers coming to the table that were not even thinking about Africa before. Some American developers that weren't even thinking of investing outside of the US. So we've seen a lot of new interests sort of wondering, what is this Power Africa thing? And we've seen real, uh, real action on the part of those developers. Second, we've seen an unprecedented level of coordination amongst US government agencies, including regular meetings amongst us all and the ability to have uh, developers come and meet all the agencies that could be relevant to their work at the same time. And third, thanks to the work of the transaction advisors and AID, we've seen spe transaction-specific support brought to bear on specific projects being worked on by, by OPIC, for example, that wouldn't have been available otherwise. So, for example, advice to extend power purchase agreements or grants to provide you know, legal advice to governments that don't have the funds to provide, to, to provide that. So uh, transaction-specific advice and grants that move transactions forward more quickly uh, than they would otherwise be able to do. So those are the three things that I see already as um, evidence of success of the, of the program. Again, Andy's done a great job 
with the AID team of coordinating all the U.S. government agencies whose resources are being brought to bear on this goal. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Keiko, are you seeing, uh, we, we, again, we heard today that there is, there is more activity, that there are more things happening, not just in the energy sector, but in infrastructure in general. Are you seeing that reflected in the number of projects that MIGA is being asked to support? And are there particular areas where you feel that you um, could be doing more or th that you're perhaps overstretched? Well, um, I think in the beginning, sub South Africa, we actually primarily focus on infrastructure, actually memory power. But at these days, we're expanding to transportation, including bridge and railway and so forth, then agribusiness, and then we would like to do more manufacturing. Yes, of course, power is the bread and butter of the business. Having said that, we also kind of need to create the jobs so people actually really, really feel the meaning of their life. I think we like to kind of moving toward that way. That's our intention. Yes, of course, private investors are not necessarily there yet, but I think, you know, well, since we are able to provide a meaningful risk mitigation for the private investors, so therefore one of our role is also guide private investor into like new area, as well as we expand the private investor base to going into such area that we would like to pursue. Thanks very much. Um, Dana, um, we often hear, and we say it ourselves, that um, what is needed sometimes is um, advice and support to governments. Um, not everybody understands the ins and outs of project finance. It's a bit of an esoteric discipline. And it's often felt that um, governments could be assisted by having uh, really reputable, independent advisors acting on their behalf, giving them counsel. And I know you've been doing quite a lot of that. I've personally come across you in, in Malawi um, and in other countries. So can you tell a little bit about what you're doing on that particular capacity building front. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Helen. It, it, it's absolutely true that MCC's approach, and I referenced this briefly, is a very holistic approach above and beyond a specific project. Um, so that we will often engage uh, first with the economists in, in one of our partner countries uh, around an analytic constraints to growth analysis to identify uh, impediments to private investment, uh, and then work our way through whatever sector, whatever area we're focusing on um, to include uh, hard infrastructure, but then to include a policy environment that surrounds that infrastructure that will support uh, private investment overall as well as MCC's particular investment. So, uh, I think the commitment that we make to countries, which will be essentially a seven to eight year window, uh, that we will be a partner with the country, uh, and that the way in which MCC approaches the partnership, that is uh, without any sort of preconceived ideas of particular areas or particular needs, but in a collaborative way and a very data-driven, evidence-based way uh, that ultimately gets us to an area of focus. Um, what we hear is that it is a very trusted and a very valued partnership. And as part of that, uh, we are absolutely focused on the governance issues, uh, not just the governance uh, and technical capacity issues in the particular sector, be it transportation, be it energy, uh, but the overall governance issues uh, related to rule of law and judicial systems and sanctity of contract and the like. Um, so it's, it's, that is the heart of the MCC model. Uh, and of course, we are, we are providing grant assistance, uh, but we are very mindful to use that, those resources in a way that is much larger uh, than the dollars themselves. Great, thank you very much. <coughs> Um, James, I'm going to be slightly controversial with you. Um, 
you mentioned a very large coal project that you're developing. How confident are you that you're going to be able to finance that? Because so many of the traditional lenders to Africa will not touch coal uh, for well-known reasons. So are you confident that you'll find the funds to, to, to build that project? Thank you for that question. Uh, the project is approximately $1.8 billion, billion dollars, uh, 75% debt, 25% equity. We've, we've sewn up the debt, more or less, the 75%. Uh, the, the EPC is, is Chinese. The, the senior lender is Chinese as well. Uh, we have a smaller component, $200 million, which we are closing. The equity component is about $400 million. We are putting in about $150 million of that. We have, um, we have interest. For the 250 that is left, we have interest for about $500 million from various investors who are doing, who are doing due diligence. So I'm fairly confident we are going to close. We are targeting to get to financial close in, in October. It has a 42-month construction period. Uh, just with your permission, I want to address the second aspect, which is the perception of coal and why this project in the context of when one looks at Kenya, Uganda, and their other sources of power, renewable sources of power. So the point is that as a country, we want to increase power generation from around 1,400, 1,700 megawatts to around 5,000 megawatts. The electricity penetration rate is about 22%. 22% of households have access to power. And when you compare Kenya and its largest competitors in Africa, Egypt and South Africa, our per capita installed power is about 3% of Egypt and about 8% of South Africa. It's, it's very, very small. So there's a push to increase. And the mix is from both renewable sources and other sources. So there are big renewable projects like the 300 megawatt to kind of wind, wind project. Now the issue, however, is the following is that with a lot of the renewables, let me take wind as an example, it's not based on power. For you to sustain 300 megawatts of wind or 20 megawatts of wind in the grid, you need about three or four times that power as this load. So as a country, traditionally our base load power has been hydro. Now hydro, we are having challenges with the diminishing hydrological conditions in the country. So you need another source of base load power that is affordable, hence coal. The, we've looked at Jodamo. And Kenya is blessed with huge geothermal resources. Now, the challenge we've experienced with geothermal also being a developer of geothermal is the amount of time it takes to develop the resource. So if you want to develop a thousand megawatts of geothermal resource, it's just it takes a long time. Now, the advantage of coal is at one, it's cheap at 7.8 US cents. It's the cheapest source of power in the country. It is quick installation time. It is, uh, it, it is base load, and it's perhaps substituting more environmentally damaging sources of energy that are currently in use in use at the moment. Spirit of defense, good on you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Kevin, uh, I'll be slightly provocative with you too. Uh, we've seen um, one of your big rivals, namely GE, beginning to move into um, project development because they feel that there are not sufficient good projects coming across their desks. Are you tempted to do the same thing, or do you not see the need for that? I think we're already doing that, um, just like our competitors. We have our own um, in-house project finance area. We are able to raise finance for projects. We are able to partner with other institutions, KFW, etc. So we're already doing that, and we've already funded some of the projects and pushing them forward. Um, and I think it's a space that we have to play in. For me, what is quite um, concerning is the reality is, like we have alluded to before, when you go to the continent, you see a lot of Chinese, more and more and more. And I'm also saying to companies like Standard Bank, you know, we don't see these guys there, or, or it doesn't come out compared to the Chinese. And we need to see a lot more mixture in there for a healthy, full co um, competition. So we need more aggression from the Western North Americas and Europe, basically. And I think what they are waiting for is a lot of pre-feasibility information going through that thorough process. And 
in most places, the continent just doesn't have the time or the patience for that. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter, but that is mix I would like to see change, personally. Yes, it's, a, it's an interesting observation. I, I think at every conference, people cite the famous Moody's report that shows that project finance <coughs> deals in, in Africa are incredibly robust. There is almost no failure at all. Um, but that is precisely because they are so highly structured, as you alluded to. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to the floor. I'm sure that you've got all sorts of questions for my distinguished panel. So um, please say your name clearly. I'm Brother Deb. And uh, say what your organization is and if it's relevant to whom you're addressing your Barbara Samuels, Global Clearinghouse for Development Finance and Vice Chairman of the FFD's <coughs> Steering Committee. It's really glorious to see you all there with your instruments and your innovative approaches to get finance. But 2015 is a year of definition. How do we really define the global financing framework that is going to deliver on national development goals for Africa, on regional integration, and the Sustainable Development Goals. So if you were to think through exactly what we need to have in the Addis Accord, and we have right now a clause on MEGA, I don't think we have one for OPEC, um, you know, or MCC, but what is it? You know, we've had three days of meetings, starting with the, uh, the NEPAD beta project, the, the challenges of project development yesterday, the, how do we really create the pipeline of bankable projects? How can we crystallize and anchor the key concepts that need to change the paradigm so governments, DFIs, bilateral partners, and the private sector work together more effectively to deliver in on energy for Africa? Thank you. Well, there's your challenge. Who wants to go first? Uh, I just say one thing, if I may, and that is um, there is still a surprising level of suspicion about the private sector um, in, in the community around FFD, which I find unsettling, uh, despite the fact that we know that some unfair transactions have harmed the reputation of the private sector in some government circles for good reason. But that being said, the level of distrust, I think, is higher than it needs to be uh, amongst those circles about the private sector. I thought we all already agreed and understood that the, these problems can't be solved without the private sector, and that the public and private sector need to work together to share risks and, and, and deliver on it. So I, I feel like we have some more work to do in terms of explaining the role and the positive, uh, the positive role of the private sector. And I think that the businesses, busy as they are, and much as they need to focus on their own bottom line, need to engage with FFD more than they have so far. Yeah, I can agree more with Elizabeth, but I think I have to give you one number. It's already, private investment in, into Africa has charged over 50% of its final financing. That I, I definitely personally see PPPs are increasing mainstream. We, First of all, we cannot really avoid it. We cannot really ignore private. And at the same time, we are saying we need more investment. And unfortunately, a lot of G7, G8 countries are facing fiscal deficit. So, you know, a lot of agencies probably not are dreaming about 15% balance. <coughs> So therefore, I think you know we really need to think about it, how to motivate private investors to coming in, and we really need to trust them, unless otherwise they are not really coming in. Then I think risk mitigation, of, of course, have to come in. At the same time, private investor side, I think are willing to take some risk. But private <coughs> investor, we can't really talk about one private. I think private investors are kind of different risk return profile. Obviously, savvy investors, 
you know, I, of course, we talked about today a lot of James, but Helen, you're, you are also very, very heavy set investors. They are willing to take a lar relatively larger risk, but they need a relatively larger return. But different type of investors, such as pension funds or insurance company, can probably lead with moderate returns, but they really need a risk rate again. How actually we just combine those and how we can actually sort of structure the deals in a way that we can provide mitigants to combine those middle or low risk, low return type of investors here is probably the key for post-2015 financing for developmental agenda to be discussed and added. Yeah, how do you want to add anything? Sure. So, you know, it's of themselves uh, solve the problem, but when we think about the focus on data, on transparency, uh, on a, a topic that we haven't discussed much this week, which is the role of women and women's economic empowerment and gender, uh, and on scaling innovation. So I would expect that there would be uh, discussion and specific proposals in the cross-enabling environment uh, to look into this year and the next five years and 10 years of how we can make big shifts and big moves in those areas. Thank you. Well, obviously, James and Kevin, the onus is on us um, to make our voices heard in these fora. Um, also, Kevin, you mentioned reputation being very important. Um, James, you were very uh, upfront with the costs of your project. Um, I have been equally upfront in different uh, conferences about the returns that we as the private sector are taking out of our projects, why we need the, that level of return, which I have to say is nothing like what we heard about the Kenya Corridor project uh, earlier today. I was astonished at the uh, level of returns that um, they were offering from that project. It's not what we normally see. So with that, I think I should let you all go. Um, and thank you very much to my panel. They will be here, so you can, you can certainly buttonhole them and ask them more questions, but I don't want this to drag on too long, so thank you all very much indeed. But please don't get up, okay? First of all, we want to thank our leaders who are leading us into a new needed paradigm, but I ask you to stay just for a second, um, so please join me in thanking Helen and her wonderful star-studded chat. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.